Um, Sorry, Anastasia. Yeah. Uh, so, so I remember who told me that. There was a guy from the States, and what he did is, is amazing. Uh, every day he was picking a random pledger, and he was going to their house. That's awesome. Knocking the door at, a, like, I don't know, 8 o'clock. And then, hi. In the morning? That's I'm early. Here. No, <laughs> 8 o'clock, before dinner or something. <laughs> and he was like, hi, I'm here to... I'm like, I know you. Yeah, you pledged for my campaign. I'm here to play, like, two songs for you. That's and then right. they were having dinner. And that was, that was amazing. It drove That's a lot of cool. traffic. People started talking about it, making videos. Like, wow, it's amazing. Yeah, anything that, like that. Like, the thing is, um, if you have capacity to go and visit people or um, call them or anything more personal than using Skype or social media, great. It's not always possible, and especially when, you know, with a lot of Indiegogo campaigns, you get contributors from all over the world. So it's kind of a bit more tough to, like, jump over to Colombia uh, to, like, be like, hi, I want to have, uh, have some dinner. I mean, it's great. I would like to do that. Um, but you have to kind of think on a scale of things. And the other thing is if you pick a flexible funding campaign, you need to be able to fulfill the perks. So a lot of the platforms work on the fix. So if you hit it, then you fulfill. But you need to think about that. So the more kind of personal experience, it doesn't cost you anything to give someone a half an hour or hour lesson. Um, so even if you raise £10,000 less than you thought you would, it's fine. You can fulfill that. Um, and yeah, experiences, like inviting them in to, to make them feel like they're part of an exclusive party, an exclusive group of people, like having your own soundcheck party just for your Indiegogo campaigners is amazing. And like Tommy says, they will start, they'll be taking videos, they'll be tweeting about it, they'll be pushing out everywhere. And then you get that kind of ripple effect. Um, and lots of people start hearing your music and seeing what you're doing. Um, these are like, you can't really see them that well. But uh, yeah, like one hour lesson with these guys, they did like a skateboard. There was even a guy, this is, you can literally be as crazy as you want. So one guy in his campaign said, if you pay me, I think it was only like, 500 bucks or something. But he said that he'd get <laughs> your name tattooed on his ass. Am I allowed to say that? On his butt. Yeah, ridiculous. And another guy said, if you pay me, if you contribute $100, you can punch me in the, in the stomach after my, after my turn. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that. It's violent. Violence is bad. Um, but yeah, you can, literally the sky is the limit. Um, and then the other thing is be proactive, update all the time. So campaigns that post at least this many updates will raise 218% more. So it's a huge amount. And I mentioned this earlier, but treating your update, the update section as your blog is really key. These people have chosen to listen to you. They care about you. They want to know what you're doing. They want to know when you hit milestones, if you get press, if you reach 50%, if you're going to, if now, if you've, overreached your goal and now you're going to be able to add an extra tour date. All those things people want to hear. Um, so tell them about it. Um, and yeah, just be proactive. Like plan your schedule. Uh, so soft launch, plan every time you're going to reach out to someone on different channels. Find out where your audience is. Find out where your potential audience is. If, if it's on a music blog and you can guest blog um, for like maybe on the second week of your campaign when things have, when you started to get momentum. Maybe you can write a guest blog on someone, for someone and um, read people back to the campaign. Reach out to influencers, find out who's blogging about your kind of band um, and say you'll take them out to coffee and ask them to film a quick video as an update that you can send out as an update or just to share your campaign. You just have to constantly be on it every single day, which is why, again, it helps to have more than one person, um, one person on it. And that's pretty much it. These are all, we give out endless data and endless resources of how to successfully crowdfund. Um, we've got a campaign of field guide, which that's not hyperlinked, but I can send it to you. Uh, we've got a blog which talks about specifically just music and music perks, music pitching, all that kind of thing. And that's a link to all the music campaigns that are going on right now and the customer happiness team and my details. But yeah, if, you, if you're passionate enough about what you're doing, then there's no reason why you can't successfully crowdfund as long as you have the right tools and the right knowledge and like, hopefully a person to talk to about, about doing it. So yeah, any questions? Um, okay, the only thing I would like pe to advise people is Please, one of you, at least one of you, send her a tweet four o'clock in the morning. Let's see if she replies because she's I really proud I will reply. 
I will. My boyfriend's always like, who are you on the phone to? It's like two in the morning and I'm like, sorry, I have to go. My thousand Twitter lovers. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really enjoyable. You're um, so one of the things that I really enjoyed so far about pledge music is is their total offer of absolute like support from setting it up all the way to, like the whole way through and yeah. I, like obviously it sounds like you guys are super friendly so uh, would you do you assist people in that way like if I'm literally like okay guys I'm, I'm doing this thing this is my idea and I can send you every draft I do and you'll, I'll get feedback on that I mean how like what is it is there some point you're gonna go no nah, just go and launch this thing or like do a, you know like we yeah, I mean, it's kind of somewhere in the middle. Like, we want to help as much as possible. I personally want to help every single person that sets up a campaign. And by doing stuff like a workshop where I get a group of people coming with their draft campaign, it enables me to do that. Um, yes, you can send me your draft campaign. I will give you feedback. Um, I, like, uh, to be honest, I don't know the 100%, like, the support levels. Like, if they hold handhold all the way along and, like, whether that feeds into their fees and that kind of thing. Um, by the way, our fees are 4% for fixed and 9% uh, for flexible. But if you hit your flexible goal, then it goes back down to 4. So it's very, it's a big motivator to set a re realistic goal and hit it. And 4%, well, if you don't know, is quite, a, quite low for industry average. Um, so yes, I would, I would love to say that I will help you. I'm the only person in the UK. <laughs> um, we have got a dedicated music team who are way cooler than me. Like the girl, one guy is like covered in tattoos and then we've got this other woman. The head of music is like uh, this rocker chick mum who um, used to work for Pete Tong and now she heads up music. Um, they're actually cool. I am not so cool. But they, they're, in, they're in San Francisco, re like, ready to talk to you about the ins and outs. And they will help. They'll help as much as possible. And that's, again, that's kind of why we, we put so much online, online about breaking down exactly what you should do. Um, but yes, I will help you. And you and you and you. Interesting question. Asking about the rivals. That's nice. We have no rivals. All crowdfunding is amazing. We love all of them. Um, sorry if you've said this already, no, it's fine. but um, what would you recommend about the uh, length of time of the campaign? Because like, is it better to do a longer one and have more time to get it right, or better to do a short one like and really kind of kick butt with it? Yeah, um, I didn't say this. Sorry. You can run a campaign for as long as you want. Um, the optimum time is about 30 to 45 days. And the only reason for that is because it's long enough for it to be a marathon and for you to gain a lot of support and for press to come out and for you to see those, those results. But it's not lo so long that you, like, die um, <laughs> and burn out. So, yeah, I would say, because the thing is you need to keep the momentum up. Um, so you need to be motivated to be updating and talking about it. So if you can kind of pick somewhere between the 30 and 45 days, then, then that's usually quite good. And in terms of um, the, you mentioned something about, like, getting it right, you need to do all of that before. Yeah. So you kind of need to think about your campaign as, like, a two-, three-month process. Spend most of the time beforehand plotting everything out, schedule everything, reaching out to people that you think might be influential, building relationships with bloggers. If you don't have a huge social following, don't set it up the day of your campaign. Set it up like as soon as possible. Set it up now um, and start engaging with people, other musicians, uh, influencers, journalists, bloggers, and like retweet them or comment on their blogs so that when you launch your campaign, they're going to be like, oh, I know that. She has cool hair. I'm going to have a look at her campaign. <laughs> so it's not selfish. Cool. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, hi. In hi. terms of the data, the people yeah. that you get, if it's a flexible campaign, how quickly do you get that data? Is it immediate because yeah. you can then fulfill something straight away? So the pledges that you have in your campaign can be pledges that are specific to the duration of the campaign, aside from sort of more longer term ones yeah, specific they're not to the project. So they're not pledges. It comes out of that person's account. Yeah. Um, so it either sits in a PayPal account um, so you can either contribute via PayPal or via direct, uh, sorry, debit card or credit card. So it either goes straight into your account or it goes into a PayPal account that then um, you'll get at the end of the account. I think it's within like 15 days or whatever from a bank. From a bank, sorry, I did it the other way around. Your PayPal money will go straight into your PayPal account, right. and the fees will be deducted. 
so you, that you have access to that money. So if you, if it's operational and you're about to go on tour, or you you know you're you need money to do something, you can access that money straight away. But you'll have the, the email address or what have you. Yeah. So sorry, yeah, the on the campaign dashboard, as soon as as soon as anyone contributes, they give you that data. Yeah. Cool. And it will track it. But you can also sorry. Um, you can get more data. So another really good thing that I missed is market research and speaking to your audience. So you have, even halfway through a campaign, you've got a captive audience to speak to. So you can put it, send a survey monkey out or send a survey and say, uh, do you think we should do this? That we were going to do, we were going to go to this place instead of this place. What do you think? Um, so you can get like instant real-time feedback on an album that's being produced or a tour that's being planned. Hi. Hi. Um just an interesting question uh, regarding if, you, if you've been around for, for five years and with the amount of data that you have been able to collect, uh, is there um, so like a, a winning choice of words you know for your campaign you know versus uh, you know words that maybe you know um, you know have a detrimental effect? Yeah, I mean not specific enough so that it becomes a template because it, the more personal you can get, the better. So it's, it differs between campaigns. But using the word contribute instead of donate really works. Never say things like, uh, please, please, like, help me, even a little bit counts. All of that stuff actually detracts psychologically from people contributing. It's not, you're not, you're not asking for money. You're, you're, in, you're inviting them into an exclusive circle and a creative process. So avoiding those kind of begging, panhandling terms is, is a good idea. And then just being really open and honest. So speaking in your language. If you swear, then swear in your campaign. If you... Um, you know, like whatever your music is, whatever your style is, put that into your campaign and then you'll be successful. Because honesty and authenticity is very much at the heart of it. So no, in, in kind of answer to your question, there's no real um, framework for it. Can I just ask another question as well? Yeah. Um, is, um, is it uh, imperative to have um, rewards? In, on, on any campaign, or can you do a campaign without rewards? You can do a donation-based campaign. So some of our um, not-for-profits, we're huge in the cause category as well. Um, some of them are, do really well by donation. Rewards generally incentivize people, um, and particularly in music. They love you. They love what you're doing. They want to have some way of engaging with you. So they, there'll probably be an, a, an element of it that's philanthropic. They're kind of helping you on their way, but they, they want to be involved. So... I would definitely suggest uh, offering rewards, but they don't have to be expensive. Hi. Um, what is the what what are the perks of, um, of doing the fixed one over the uh, flexible one? What why is it? I guess more desirable for someone to do a fixed one. Obviously, the, there's the four percent, nine percent. Yeah. But it seems like um, you're not taking much of a gamble by just by doing the flexible one because you can get the 4% anyway. And that's why it's most popular. Um, like I said, the, if, if you definitely didn't want to commit to doing something unless you had a certain amount of money, then that would be the benefit. Having the um, kind of knowing, the knowledge that you weren't going to have to go and fulfill X, Y, and Z if you didn't have 10,000. So for example, if you, if you didn't think it was worth it um, or you couldn't go on tour or you couldn't do your album unless you had a certain amount of money, then, then you would choose fixed. But to be honest, in, creative, in the creative industries, there's not a huge amount of benefit, apart from knowing you've got a lower percentage and knowing you um, will be kind of off the hook if you don't reach it. But if you're, if you're sensible enough about your goal, then you should choose flexible. And so you, with the flexible one, you just um, kind of fulfill, you fulfill the rewards as and when you get that, as you as when you get people pledging it, is that right? Uh, no, you, you don't have to do that. You can fulfil afterwards. So, I mean, when it comes to product campaigns, people fulfil like eight, ten, twelve months after. Um, with mu with music campaigns, you generally expect to see a quicker turnaround. But if it's like a tour, if you're pre-selling tickets to a tour, then obviously um, it's going to coordinate with the dates that are happening. Or if it's going to take you five months in production of your album. People know that. They don't expect a, an instant, 
instant um, fulfillment of their perk. Okay. So it's and you can say estimated date of delivery. So even like, you could do the Twitter thank yous immediately if you wanted. Um, and generally when you, campaigners, when they get a contribution, they'll email that person, because they'll have the email, they'll just email back and be like, thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Um, like, we'll keep you updated. So it's not kind of just, it's not seen as being kind of weaker to do the flexible one, just, do you know what I mean? Like, no. or, or um, you know, do you know no, what I mean? No, no. Wimpier. <laughs> Yeah, no. The the biggest fixed campaign we had um, was Ubuntu, which is a software uh, company, and they, they they tried to raise thirty three million dollars. Uh, yeah, just a little bit, and they failed. They raised twelve point two, um, and so they actually didn't fail. They're coming out in they're moving into hardware in May, I think, and they had twenty seven thousand people give them money to say they want them to move into hardware. So they now have 27,000 people that are gonna buy their hardware phone. Um, but that's a good example of they couldn't, they physically couldn't build the phone that they said they were gonna build if they didn't have 33 million. Uh, no, that's something different. That was a, it was still open source software, I think though, that one was, but yeah. Did, that, did I answer your question or did I just go on a random tangent? Okay, <laughs> I do that a lot. <laughs> Um, quick question about the f the flexible funding. Yeah. Does it show anywhere the campaign that this is flexible funding? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there, here, it says flexible funding or fixed funding, and it says when your campaign starts and when it ends, and then these are the perks, and it tells you how long. Um, I'm sorry, I just touched it, Andre. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it tells you how long is left. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking, right, if you choose the flexible funding, doesn't it show that you're not sure whether you're going to hit your goal? And you're like, hey, probably we're going to fail, but uh, pledge. No, if that was the case, then it wouldn't have been our most successful, um, most popular funding option. Anyone who understands crowdfunding knows that there are so many uncertainties. Like. Anyone who says, I know that I can raise 15,000 uh, pounds in 30 days is probably like taking some drugs. Um, or very rich, that's the alternative. Uh, the, like the honest answer is you might know how many fans you have, you know how many Facebook li page likes you have, you know how many Twitter followers you have, but trying to convert that into people who will put their money in, put their hand in their wallet is completely different. And your label can't tell you. Your label couldn't tell you how, um, how, many, how much money you'd raise. So it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of being open and flexible, really, I would say. You don't look convinced. I don't know. I'm just thinking about it. It's all about, for me, it's all about the profile. It's about the vibe you give, right? Myself, I just come out as confident and uh, like big advantage. So I was yeah. thinking about it. If you if you show that this is a fixed campaign, it's all or nothing. You show that you're very confident that you're going to mm -hmm. achieve it, anyways. Otherwise, you wouldn't have done it. Yeah. So this this is the only reason why I asked this question. So if it was me, I would definitely go for a fixed campaign, and I would go for a more attainable goal yeah. than just for um, yeah. you know. And, and and if I if I reach this goal, probably is going to go even further. So, yeah, so I'd rather go, let's say I want to raise 5,000. I would go for 3,000 for, 3, mm -hmm. for a fixed campaign and then probably would hit like 5,000. Yeah, I mean, it depends what you're trying to raise for. For something like a tour, um, by going flexible, it's saying I actually need to raise 100,000, but I'm going to go flexible and test the market. And it's just market research, it's market validation. I'm seeing how much people care. Um, and you can make it quite clear, if you're kind of worried about that, you can say in the pitch bit, have like an infographic and say, if I get 5,000, I'm gonna do this, if I get 10,000, I'm gonna do this, with 20,000, I can do this. So people can see very clearly, like, you're not weak, you just have different options of funding. Different, different more funding will obviously unlock bigger and better things you can do, um, but again, it's about being very clear about that. Are the best video blogs the one where the artist is Personally. Speaking to the audience, like them. you mean the pitch video? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You don't. Um, I rarely see. So no video means that you'll raise. I think 113 percent less. Um, the best videos. I should have shown you one actually. If you come to the workshop, I'm, I'll show you videos and good examples, and I'll ask you why you think it's good. And it's generally because. Um, the artists are there personally speaking to you, so you feel like you're part of it. They're being very honest, and you know they're either singing to you or they're like 
joking around with you and talking in the same way that you see them on Twitter and in their blog and all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, if you have somebody else representing your band or um, your your vision, it doesn't work. Why, like, as a as a contributor, why would I buy into that? Because I've been, I was thinking, like, analysing a lot of campaigns over the summer, and. Um, yeah, no, that's kind of going to save a lot of hassle, really, if you decide to do it personally, because a lot of people come up with really creative ideas. Um, like there's a really good comedy one. I can't remember what it was. It's really, really not the helpful. The thing is, like, um, I'll play a good comedy one as well. Like, tapping into humor. If you're a funny band and you, you're funny guys, like, doing an animation or doing, like, a sketch work or whatever, it can, it can work, definitely. Um, it's just that, A, resources, it, you need more money to do that, and B, um, there's still, I think there still needs to be an element of you and the why. The video is very much the why. It's not, I play this song and I want to play it for you. It's, it's like, why, why am I not, why don't, I have a, why don't I have a corporate job? Why do I, like, go down this creative path and do this for you? Like, for all my fans, you're all trying to spread a message. You're all doing it for love and passion. That's the number one reason you're all musicians. Um, and that's what needs to come across, because that's what's most powerful. So in general, they're usually just like personal talks, yeah. and then a few yeah. split edits, maybe to performances, and then back to the yeah, yeah. You can, chat. you can, yeah, you can like either play right there and then, or you could cut to some footage of you playing somewhere else. And again, it's very short. It's like um, we are uh, kings, and this is what we do. This is what we love. We've toured around the whole country. We've. Uh, had you know best-selling albums we've been sold out on blah 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 what we really want to do now is make this video to tell you why we love doing what we do so much but we need your help okay so is it usually around a minute the best pitches mm, no in, probably a bit longer than that but i'd say probably about two two to two and a half yeah under three is is good people will watch about three minutes in general youtube and what's your three f most favourite campaigns? Um, music campaigns. Yeah. Um, I really like this one because I'm a big fan of not misfortune in general, but uh, <laughs> I I just think it's really I, like they're a very cool, um, very cool band, like very good like characters, and I quite like that the manager, the tour manager, put it up. Um, so it wasn't them being like, oh, we need to go and raise some money. It was like, these guys have just had this really terrible thing happen to them. They were going and doing what they loved, and then they were just having a bit of food, and this happened to them. And it's very honest. Like, it's, if you read the campaign, if you watch the video, it's very, like, raw. And that's why I like it. Um, obviously, got to like the Architects one, because the video is great. And they're UK, so have to like that. And um, these guys, these... Uh, oh, I'm, no, this, this, these guys, Cuckoo. Um, yeah, they didn't raise, actually, they raised a reasonable amount of money. What you'll also notice about the goals, um, they either raise kind of just the right amount, so they've done a lot of research into how much they should raise, or they go crazily over. So, like, um, We the Kings tried to raise 35, and they raised 150. But their goal is very uh, conservative, particularly because they have a, a huge following. Um, album, I think. Yeah. I can send you all of these links. I'll like put together a... a uh, I'm going to have all the, all the slides together. I'm going to send them all. Yeah, but these don't have... They're not hyperlinked to the campaign. So I, I'll put that together. Uh, quick question. So I've realised that people in general, they love like funding a mission, mm -hmm. not funding like a product creation. A, I'm creating the new CD, like prepay. They like being part of something, you know, an experience, a mission, you know, somebody robbed us, like help us, like, That's me. get the yeah, things back, you know, um, so. Is it, yes and no, uh, your fans are your fans, like, if there's a story behind it, great, but at the end of the day, Indiegogo is being used as a pre-selling platform, it's a way, it's just a way to cut out that middleman, it's a way for you to have ownership over your content, and you're speaking to your fans directly and saying, I'm not signed to a label. I've chosen not to be signed to a label because at the end of the day, all, all that matters is you. I'm bringing this out. We're bringing this album out for you and you can directly get it before anybody else can. And it's a way to kind of give them an exclusive entrance into it. So even though it is pre-selling it, they're still the first people out there that are going to have this album and they might have their name in it or they might have a song written about them. 
in it. So it doesn't have to be a mission. Your mission is like your art. That's your mission. Yes, your, your mission. Yes, your mission is your art. Um, if you can, you? if you can, if you can convey that through your story, yeah. I think people need to know the story of the artist. But what, so if you were going to set up a crowdfunding campaign, uh, Tommy Darker, who is Tommy Darker? What would you raise it for, and how would you? Like, what's your story? Tommy Darker. So what's the hat? Is that the creator of Darker Music Talks? Is that the musician? Is that the musician. myself who want to go for holidays? Or what? Not holidays. I'm not going to fund you going on holiday, Tommy. Somebody did. Uh, really? <laughs> and they got funded. They said, hey, I'm working too hard. Was it you? No, 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 no. That was, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. But you, t but you told me about it. Um, wow. So yeah, somebody said, you know, whatever. I want to go, I gonna, I wanna go for a holiday. No, it was, it was a fun page. It was God on, on Facebook. There's, there's, a, there's a, yeah, God it's a page, God I'm God, I'm God, and he's just writing funny spiritual stuff, and he says, I'm God, I'm working too hard, I've been working too hard from the, the dawn of humanity, I want to go on holidays, please fund me, <laughs> and he got the money. That's quite a funny campaign. I think I'd fund God to go on holiday, I'm not sure about you, but uh, I'm, so I'm only God. joking, I'm so you are, God. you're my God. Um, so yeah, musician Tommy Darker. So musician Tommy Darker. What's, um, your, what's your story? So the story is that I've created this series of interactive theatrical rock experiences where it's a theatrical play, the audience is part of the play, there are characters without them knowing. So you come in, in the place, you know, there are 40 people with you, they don't know who is who, but I, I have a goal for them. So by the way I perform and everybody else, we show them who they are and they if they want to be interactive, they just choose to do something and make it more interesting. But anyways, there is a story unfolding. And in the meanwhile, every three minutes, four minutes, there's like songs that have to do something with the story. So the story is being explained in front of their eyes through an interactive thing. So this is, obviously there needs, I need to have production uh, because I've been trying, you know, low scale with this and this and people loved it. But now in order to make it happen even bigger, I need to have some funding for this. So probably that would be why I would have a campaign. Yeah. And I haven't thought about what should be in the video. We have, with Pavel, we have like uh, footage from all the previous performances, so maybe I could do something so I can showcase what I've done before so people can see what, how amazing it is. Some other people might give um, testimonials. I felt strange and it was great. And what. You, you, you said it was strange. He was at the first performance that was not really theatrical, but he said- Strange is good. I'm like, hey, Tara, how was it? He's like, it, it was- Strange. <laughs> yes. But yeah, um, probably would be the story. Why have I done this? What's the mindset behind, behind all that? And I have answers to all these questions. So that would be it. That's your why. That's your story. Have you heard of you, you, you Me Bum Bum Train? Sounds really dodgy. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. it is, right? I won't tell you what it is because if it comes back, I think it comes back every year or something. Anyway, it's this crazy uh, theatrical experience, let's call it. Um, and it sounds a little bit like what you're doing, but involving music. I'm unique. Uh, not, not like yours. It's way worse. Um, it's, I think it's in association with um, Barbican, and they do it in East London. And you, you go through all these different experiences, like these scenes. And so the kind of audience, like the person that wants to go is just someone that is a bit creative, likes to do cool, fun, new stuff, and experience new things. Um, so it, in the same way that somebody who would go to your show loves music, loves rock, but also wants to be part of it. They don't want to be a passive viewer. They don't want to sit in a seat 50 feet away and just listen to it. They want to be involved in it. They want to be engaged with you. So it's very much you sat there on camera being like, like, don't you ever get bored when you're listening to your favorite song and you just kind of want to get up and like kick something or whatever? You can do that with Tommy Darker music shows. Punch me in the face. Yeah, punch me in the face. Yeah. So that's your story, that's your why. It doesn't need to, what I'm saying is it doesn't need to be this crazy mission like your like dog died or, um, I don't know why that is, or you lost all your equipment. It, it doesn't necessarily have to have that story. <laughs> I know mean, why I said dog died. Dogs should never die. And that's a terrible reason to crowdfund a music campaign. Yeah. <laughs> Unless your dog was your inspiration. Anyway, next question. Uh. I'm kind of feeling sad about the imaginary dead dog now. I know. <laughs>
Um, no, I actually didn't want to ask a question, but I did want to say I noticed not many of us put our hands up when you asked if anyone had crowdfunded before. And if uh, yeah. based on this talk, it's lovely to hear because I, I did crowdfund and I was successful. It wasn't for much money, but it was successful and I did what I needed to do. And I learned some very valuable lessons doing it. And if I'd heard this talk first, I think I would have made a lot less errors. So if anyone does want to ask me at all, um, at anything um, about my experience of doing it by myself um, and why you should never do that, um, then please talk to me. Why so did you, um, what was it for? It was for my last EP. Cool, and how much were you trying to raise? I was aiming for 1,500 pounds, and the reason that it was so little is because I have a friend here in London who has some friends who have a really nice studio, and they offered me this amazing discounted price just to like like four days in this, uh, for one day in the studio, four tracks, and then we did the post like everything else we added um, at his home studio over over the next few months. So, but it just kept the costs so low. So. I was aiming for 1500. I knew that I needed more than 1500, but the guys recommend they're like, well, based on your size of your fan base, da, da, da. and that was kind of one of my errors was to not really look into how much I really needed and be realistic about that with myself from the start. Um, but I did end up raising just over 2000. So I raised, uh, you know, in the ratio, yeah, it was it was great. It was yeah. really. And the people who funded it, it, it is that truly is an amazing experience to be connected to those people. Like I still see those. I saw one of them came to a gig. I hadn't seen her since the thing, and she was at my gig on Saturday, this past Saturday. And to see her was I didn't realize how j like jarring in a positive way that would be to be like, dude, you made this happen. Like, wow, You're, yeah. thank you. Like it's yeah. a re that's the personal part of it is everything I live for as a, as a musician and a yeah. communicator and a storyteller. It's completely. Um, yeah, so it was it was lovely, and but I did make many many mistakes in a. So but that's why you crowdfund. Like it's that person in the crowd that you can go up to and be like, "Thank you." I literally wouldn't be stood here if you hadn't have given me. It might have only been twenty five pounds, but they chose to give you that money that they could have spent on something else. But they believed in you. They love what you're doing. I do actually have one question, something that I'm still slightly struggling with, is that some of the people didn't have to put their addresses in when they chose their perks. Is that something you do with Indigo? Because I'm still trying to get like to email these people like, where is your address? I still want to send you this package I've got sitting at home waiting. So I think um, once you contribute, you are then... Um, you, you get the details and then you email them. So you can just email them a like an automated spreadsheet saying, fill in your address, your phone number, this, 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 and then you should be able to capture all that data. Why do people not give you your address? Don't they want their perks? That's what I wonder. I don't know. I still have like eight of they them. They just love home. me. They're yeah. like, I don't need anything. Yeah. I'm just part of you. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Cool. I want to ask a question to everyone. So who hasn't done, hasn't tried a campaign, started a campaign? Okay, one of you. I would like to ask you a question, and I would like an answer. So tell me two reasons why you haven't started a crowdfunding campaign. Who, who is brave enough to answer? The microphone. Um, quite easily, in that I haven't got um, my thing ready yet. If, I've, if I had it, um, my plan, I would I'd be doing it, basically. But uh, that's why. Does that make sense? As in, yeah, I haven't got it ready yet. As in, <laughs> as in I haven't got my, my product, my, my campaign, what, I'm, what I would need the campaign for. Yeah, you're still kind of deciding yeah. what you need money for, what you're, like, yeah. the I mean, identity of your... It. It's not like a, a fear thing, which I think you were, I don't know if that was you, what you were trying to get, like, what am I worried about? No, no, but yeah, that and was that's it. good. <laughs> if you're not ready, then uh, it's great not to set up a campaign, because a lot of people get excited, um, especially in the arts industries where funding is zero and it's impossible to get signed. They get really excited because they think it's free money and they just launch a campaign and they f fail. And then you feel worse because you're like, oh, great. The one option that I had <laughs> is, <laughs> is now dead. Um, like my dog. And my dog is dead. <laughs> so <laughs> people have forgotten. No, I, I want to ask. So you told me you're not ready um, in terms of product as well. Let's say you know your music is not recorded or what well, the plan is is uh, I'm going to be demoing my album um, over the next month or so. Um, if it is to a standard that can be um, then put out and it's good enough for people to buy, then I would look to do a, a campaign to put some PR into it. Um, and if it isn't good enough quality recording standard for, for people to listen to, then I would l use the campaign to get better recordings of it. So it's definitely something I'm going to do. I just need to wait until I've done the recording. If that makes any sense. Yeah. You can also, like, 
you know, even if it's just you need a grand for studio time, like people raise just that. If you just need studio time, it's, it's a very clear objective. People get it, and you just raise a small amount of money. And it's, it's kind of that step process that I was telling you about. You just need a grand to get into a studio. Then you need to do this. Then you need to do that. And you come back, and we have really good success of campaigners coming back and who the first people that funded you for your studio they're going to care about your album or they're going to care about your EP because they funded you yeah that's what I was thinking about um, if if you do have some the outline of some songs you know you don't need to have recorded the songs first you know you could be with the demo and like here's the whole album here's the whole album this is what we're trying to have good recordings for and this is like validation you know you you, you suspect that it might be good music, it might be good enough for people to buy, but you might realize that nobody actually likes, you know, like, not, not the recordings, but the, the songs themselves. You know, it's like a way of, of marketing research, let's say, in, a, in the bad language of marketing, you know. So you don't need to have the perfect product. That's, th that's what I think crowdfunding is for. It's, it's, uh, do I need to smile? Hi. Hey. I, I think crowdfunding is about not having the perfect product and finding out what, uh, what other people do and what they want by involving them in any way. And I think the most great ideas come out of the people participating. Like for here for Dark Music Talks, I got all the amazing ideas out of people saying, why don't you do that? I'm like, why haven't I thought about that? And that, that's how it goes, by involving people. You, you want to? Yeah, yeah. Um, What's your name? Uh, Nicholas, how you doing, guys? Hi, um, yeah, I'm really glad you asked that, because I think, personally, from everyone I speak to, um, obviously the music business has changed quite dramatically. But I think the big thing, um, I was reading um, something, or my teacher told me I did, came off a music business degree at ACM. And um, what I am concerned about is the stripping away of mystery of an artist and kind of like artistic integrity and all these arguments that some of the best artists actually didn't talk to their audience and had, you know, a real, you kind of wanted to find out about them. And sometimes social media, I, I'm feeling, obviously it's, it's, it's per artist has their own unique way of marketing. Um, certain artists, and for instance, the celebrity culture we live in, I, I'm feeling like a lot of credible people are, are kind of diminishing their integrity in a way. Um, and that's been my biggest kind of concern with doing anything too personal with an audience. Um, I think I was reading something about the Rolling Stones, how the actual manager of the Rolling Stones said that he never would let the Rolling Stones meet his fans after, uh, after, their, after their gigs because he wanted them to be seen as legends. And I thought that was really fascinating. Um, so I guess that's kind of my big concern with, with I suppose, culture in general. But. Um, Sorry, I just wanted to say that. I've been no, that that I've years, never. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really heard that argument um, that much before, and it's interesting, and it, it applies to every industry, every art that is now, because the kind of facade and the you me, uh, you me, like me here, you there, is gone with the rise of digital and the rise of online. Like being accessible and being able to tap into your fans. That's that's what social media is about. Yeah. Yeah, but you're still giving insight into that band. And the thing is, um, that is a fair argument, but most musicians and artists these days want to connect directly with the people that they're doing it for. <coughs> and this just gives them, this is just a tool to allow them to do that. Um, but I'm sure there'll be lots of artists that want to kind of maintain that mystery and, and not go down that path. Because, and if you, if you want to keep that mystery, then you won't be successful crowdfunding because you don't want to be, you, you know, you can't be open. Um, and crowdfunding relies on you being, inviting people in. Um, but maybe, I don't know, culturally, maybe in years to come, there'll be this new kind of mystery around being in, in the invited circle. And yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting cultural argument. Thanks for bringing it up. Um, I, I think we have the perfect artist to answer this question. The gentleman over here. You can see that he's very mysterious anyway. Uh, wearing a hat. <laughs> yes. He's always mysterious. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, like, mystery is... It, I think we're in an age now where mystery is... It, it's no longer like, okay hiding from your fans, it's engaging with them. Um, for example, musicians in here will know 
to write, you write a song, there's no mystery in it. You have to go through those 10,000 shit lyrics to get that one line. And that one line might spark, a, um, spark the idea. But I think sharing the ideas well, with people that you can still maintain mystery. You know, I think um, you look at art, art, art's like beauty, you know. Um, it's like connecting to the real world. And I think um, if you show that spark, that spark is undeniable. You know, you look at a painting, you, you listen to a song, which you connect with, it's undeniable. And I think the beauty of the, the digital age is that um, it's showing that the transparency is the, mis is the mystery. You know, it's being honest. It's um, it's putting your rule into your work and just sharing sharing that. And I think um, you can still maintain mystery and engage with fans. I think it's it's just a new way of doing it. No, that, that's a great point. Um, yeah. I gotta say, Nicholas. So Rolling Stones, they were not really heroes or mysterious. Or they faked their profile because they could. Nobody could see what they're doing on social media. It's, 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 it's about the way things were going before, you know, that there was no option for other people to know what you're doing. So you could be down there with chips on your belly and then checking out, like, hey, you're going out in five minutes, and then you go out and you become the rock star. Now everybody can see what you're doing anyways, because it just, this is just the way culture goes, you know? It's transparency. That's the, the general feeling of people. That if you're not transparent, they know you're hiding something, probably you're, you're scammy, probably this is how it's going. If you don't show what you do, if you don't show your real face, people can tell you're not authentic. It, it's a cultural thing, it's a mindset now, how people are wired. I just think different, like a lot of marketers actually work on the process of mystery and not unleashing everything. But I suppose that's what you're saying, you can choose how you want to market anyway from a personal perspective. So. You're not giving away everything. This is what you're saying. <laughs> Go. I think we're living in a world now that's it's so like we we live in a world which is so instant. Like I was watching a video the other day, and a man was talking about like how if you're walking down a desert like island in fucking Texas, five three out of the five people will be on their phones, you know, and. What they're doing is they're scrolling down Twitter and they're scrolling down Facebook, you know. So our culture is so instant nowadays. So you have to be transparent. You have to be transparent. And I think how you capture people is with the story. Because I don't know about you, I just got my new iPhone. And I didn't buy it because of the phone. I bought it because of Steve Jobs. It's the idea. You, it's the idea that this phone in your hand can change the world. And... Apple have a conference every year where they t they take you through, they take you through the, the whole process of building the phone. They show you they're transparent, but what they how is how they tell it. It's it's how they use their transparency to tell the story. And I think they're amazing at telling stories. I think I found out that the other day it takes it costs twenty dollars to make a an iPhone. Twenty dollars, but it's the it's the idea that's in your hand. It's not the product. It's the idea. You buy the story. I think. <laughs> you better use your hashtag, right? Of course I use hashtags. Yeah. Um, yeah, a couple of things actually. Just a, a, a thing about the Rolling Stones as well. A lot of times when you're hearing, um, yeah, especially the PR or the tour managers or whatnot, they're trying to put out a persona. But Rolling Stones used to rock up at blues clubs all the time and just sit in the audience and play and jam with loads of guys. So that's completely at, at odds with not getting with your fans, plus the amount of people Mick Jagger slept with. I mean, he probably slept with most of his fans anyway. So, like, that's I think... engagement right there. Yeah, uh, real engagement, you know, yeah. cut and thrust of it. So, yeah, solid. So I think, uh, I mean, a lot of times, you know, there'll be one story that comes from this side of the camp and then completely different behaviour, but I think the difference is that nowadays... As your man was saying, everybody's got their phones ready. So if an artist does anything, everybody will know about it. Whereas back then, an artist can do loads of stuff and you only find out about it years later when somebody comes forward with, oh, I found some photos and, you know, who wants to see those? Maybe you do. Um, but to go to Tommy's question about um, what's stopping people 
go starting their campaigns or whatnot. I did actually help somebody. I did a video for somebody who was launching a campaign, a product campaign. They actually did it on Indiegogo. Um, and my concern, they, they were they had a particular time frame they had to work to, so they had to push things through really quickly. And I thought that they were going to struggle because they didn't have really any any fan base. It was a brand new product. It came out of absolutely nowhere, so it wasn't. It was a, a bath safety toy for kids. Tappy. Oh yeah. Well, Jesus. It, it worked. <laughs> Tappy. Wow. So all right, it got it got. So um, yes, Tappy, which is now in Jojo Mama Baby. Little plug for them there. They're stocking it. But anyhow, um, so I think a lot of artists, a lot of people, would be really concerned that they don't have enough of a fan base to start a campaign. So a question would be: Is there has there been shown to be a certain kind of size that after you've hit? then you should start a campaign or have people done it where they've got a list yeah. of two people or um i wish i had an answer to that i actually was like in san francisco last week being like tell me is there you know is there a threshold of once you've got huh gave you what <laughs> love this guy my favorite i'll show you what was the answer 